Report for Success Express, your business, career, and financial radio magazine. Hosted by Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazines.com. San Diego employment attorney Ward Heinrichs is back on Big Blend Radio Success Express show today to talk about some noteworthy workplace harassment and discrimination cases in the world of film, hospitality, and tourism. Now, Ward is a regular Big Blend Radio guest and contributor to Big Blend Radio and TV magazine. So you can see his articles if you just go to blendradioandtv.com. And he also call, like talks about uh, the tourism and hospitality industry in regards to employment law in Parks and Travel magazine. And you can go to see his work there if you go to nationalparktraveling.com. But if you are in San Diego or California, the best thing to do is go to his website, bestemploymentattorneysandiego.com. He's got a great blog as well. And you can follow him on Twitter and Facebook under Ward Heinrichs. Hey, Ward, how's it going? It's going very well. How's it going with you, Lisa? Hey, doing good. Nancy, you're out here in the sunshine. It's it's nice and it's fall in, it, in the it, desert. It, it is actually cooling down. Can so you believe fall. it? How is yeah, good for you. Feel fall? Are you ready for October? Fest? Well, it, the the temperature has decreased. You know, we had a, a sweltering summer with lots of humidity, which we're not very used to. We usually get like a couple weeks of it, but this year um, the winds from the south blew up a lot uh so it was like two months of sweltering hot weather and and now it's it really has cooled off quite a bit i was in san francisco uh over the weekend and it was that much cooler up there i mean so california's cooled off yeah san francisco is always cold i'm always in shock like suddenly like what i have to have a jacket on you go especially if you go from the desert to there you're like what what just happened it's the best city it is it's it's a beautiful beautiful city san francisco oh it's fun it's definitely a lot of fun. I, I love that area and good wineries out in that region too. Just saying. <laughs> just, well, and, and you've got them in San Diego and you've got beer in San Diego. So you're in, you're in a good spot. Uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about harassment and discrimination, uh, some noteworthy cases. I know we've talked about this over the years. And uh, everyone, uh, Ward's article, uh, you can see it up on nationalparktraveling.com and in the fall issue of Parks and Travel magazine. And this one, uh, we talk about, we're going to revisit one of the cases we talked about in the past. Um, we're going to talk about the Friends case, um, some film history, and we're also going to talk about a hotel management group. And we're going to talk about uh, a tennis club, uh, those cases going into tennis clubs. And, you know, this is interesting. So we're going to talk about discrimination in regards to a, an employee's weight. Uh, we're going to talk about rape. My gosh, um, a, a drunken trespasser, yeah. possibly <laughs> rape, wow. raping. A, serious. I know, this oh. is serious. Um, it's one of the employees. And so this is interesting, but um, this is a case we've talked on before is the Lyle versus Warner Brothers. And uh, yeah, now you, we've. I think we've talked about this before 2017, right? I, I, this has been going on for a little bit longer than that. Yeah. You know, I don't remember the, the date on the Lyle case, yeah. but it, it's much older. Um, and I didn't cite it in, in the article. Uh, the 2017 was a site to uh, a case that it has related issues. And it's about uh, harassment on someone who's uh, African-American. So, but a very similar issues, and I just wanted to show how that law has seemed to progress a little bit. I mean, it depends what you call progressive or not, but um, it's developed more. So I wanted to show how, how it, uh, the Lyle case found uh, a certain holding, and then it looked like this next case, the Daniel case, uh, also found for pretty much the same reason, uh, a similar holding. And so this is interesting because when you're, you go into the creative world and um, I know even from radio shows that things happen, Mm. (laughs) you know, it's like, it's the creative place. And when you're creating something, um, people start throwing ideas and they're getting creative and this is what this looks like, or Mm -hmm. this is what this sounds like, or this is what happens. And some people could get offended by that. I know Nancy and I just, even in the magazine Mm -hmm. world, we've, we've been through some of those issues. Um, So it's a very, it's a delicate place and some people get offended, but, um, if things are said like in, in Daniel versus, uh, Wayans, um, this is a very interesting part because it, it was about the TV show friends and some of the language that was used in developing the content. Right. 
Well, uh, yeah, Daniel wasn't about Friends. Now, Daniel's about okay, Haunted okay, House okay. too. Yeah. Uh, Friends is, a, is Lyle versus Warner Brothers. And, the yeah, the language there was quite colorful. But, uh, I mean, you know, I'll, they talked about blowjobs. They talk about, you know, can I say that on the air? <laughs> they talk about no, no, that's having it. sex that's with... That's it. We're taking you to court. That's the thing. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it's in the case. So I'm just quoting the case. You uh, reading it, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, it talked about having sex with different women. It talked about uh, naked women. It talked about mutual masturbation. It talked about having sex with some of the female cast members. So... Uh, that normally, you know, that would be a very good case for the typical workplace. But here, Lyle was warned that this is part of the creative process. And uh, the California Supreme Court said, yeah, in this case, especially when there's warnings, um, but not necessarily, you don't necessarily need the warnings. The creative process is a protected process. And uh in, under these circumstances, that type of language and that, and that type of uh, action is, uh, would not lead to a harassment case. And so she lost her case. Wow. Now, if, if you, um, because we've worked with a, um, a lot of creative people, and there are moments when they get a little crazy and they say things. If you, when you hire I'm somebody, you, can, can, I know, <laughs> what? Um, can you like put in your job description or, you know, when they sign papers that they understand that this could happen so that they can't come back at you later? Is that valid to do? Is, does that work? It, well, I, it, would it be ironclad? Not necessarily. It's going to depend on the facts of the case. Would it help? Yeah. In this case, if they'd had, in the Lau case, if they'd had a written agreement saying, you're going to be exposed to this as part of the creative process. Now you got something that she has contemplated and signed, and that's even better. But you didn't actually need that in Lyle. Uh, the description was enough. Now, what I will say, though, is if you have something written like that, that mirrors a case holding, you, you may be able to prevent a lawsuit from being filed at all. So I think that's a pretty darn good idea, and it's probably a better defense in terms of saving yourself some costs and fees in defending a case. And so when it comes to now Daniel versus Wayne, let me get there, because you were kind of using this as um, it's the Lyle case, you know, Lyle versus Warner Brothers is kind of a similar thing. Um, right. This was This is not going from... Okay, people are talking sexually. Now we're going into now you're talking about race in a way. This is this is going into race, right? Yeah, it's it's based based on racial discrimination and harassment. Uh, so the Lyle case is about sexual harassment, and and the um, Daniels case is about racial harassment, which is equally actionable as sexual harassment. You don't see it as often, but mm -hmm. it. it does happen and you can file a case based on it but the holding here was real similar um, because uh, this was part of a creative process uh, to develop a, a movie which is called ha a haunted house 2 and I, I didn't go see it but I remember when it came out um, and of course it's a spoof it's crazy uh, the director's crazy you know they you know they're always goofing around so that was part of the process and that the court didn't come out and, and say, they didn't even cite Lyle, but they did refer to the creative process a lot throughout the case. So um, I'm not going to go into the why it was sort of found on slightly different grounds, but uh, because it's really procedural, the the theme is still true. Uh, and and it, it's a, it, you can see it clearly uh, in between the lines, and it's really about the creative process. If you have a creative process, it's protected speech. It's, this was a First Amendment case, really, because of the uh, oh, wow. procedure. It was a First Amendment case. And so it was protected speech because it was creative, and therefore Mr. Daniels lost his case. Even though they had said things like, uh, or they made fun of him and said that he, uh, he looked like this cartoon character, uh, uh, an African-American cartoon character, uh, they called him nigga, uh, and they made fun of his afro. So you know that stuff. If you see that in the a general workplace, you, you know you're gonna you're gonna have a big problem. <laughs> but yeah. in this again, in this circumstance, not so much. But because 
I was going to say, if you hear a, a comment that, that seems to be racist, but it wasn't directed at you, then can you really call it harassment? You know, that's a great question. And courts originally had said it has to be directed at you, but there was a harassment case. And we've talked about this one too, and I'm not remembering the name of it right offhand, but uh, it was about uh, a marketing uh, portion of a company and they would uh, get on the phone and they'd talk demeaningly about women and uh, they had porn on their uh, right. monitors and all this stuff. And it wasn't directed directly at the one female who was in this department, but since it was so pervasive and permeated the whole uh, work place that uh, they found that even though it wasn't directed at her, it was still harassment. Wow. So what happens in the office? I've worked in an office like this many years ago, where when you walked in the office, you came through the file room where all the files were, and you had to walk by the salesmen, and they were all men. And as you walked by, there were cat calls and whistles, and, and it was really embarrassing. Now, the older woman, you just like, yay, whatever. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm I'm being. I'm trying to be polite here. Hey, (laughs) boy, boys, there's nothing wrong with that. (laughs) But as as a um, yeah, it's like yippee. No, sorry, I just had my birthday. As a young as a young person just out of high school, it was kind of it was kind of embarrassing, and it 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 was it was unsettling, yeah, horrible, and you know um, so. Is that considered harassment? Uh, well, it, I think it depends on how often it's done. I mean, if it were like one time, probably not. If it's every day, well, that sounds like it permeates the working conditions and that it's pervasive. And it, I, I'm going to say it's also severe. Now, under the federal law, it has to be both pervasive and severe. Under California law, it has to be one or the other. That's all you have to prove. You can prove both, but if you can only prove one or the other, that's good enough. So it sounds to me, at least under California law, that it's pervasive. And then the question is, well, would a reasonable person under those circumstances feel harassed? And uh, I'm going to say probably um, so it, it sounds like, it, and, and you know, the other thing you said you started this with was, well, was it directed at you? And I'm, I'm going to say that's probably directed at you. So you don't even have to get over that hurdle, which is not much of a hurdle anymore anyway, because it's so pervasive in the workplace. So sounds to me like you might have a case or you might have, and it's a little late now. but Well, yeah, but I remember, I mean, I just remember a group of, of young girls. We all got together and we went to the manager and he thought it was this hysterical he thought it was the funniest thing he ever heard because we said and so then our solution <laughs> was funny, but... we wouldn't no we wouldn't go just... through the back door yeah. and get to work the 10 minutes yeah. early that they asked you to we went to the front door yeah. thank you automobile club of southern california oh, nailed and we waited for the i didn't manager see no word then <laughs> to, to open the door and then he was like you're late and we're like no you're late opening the door yeah just mm. say it yeah. That's a bad situation. That's not bad. That's not a good situation. No, that's no. Not. Yeah, that's not. Now there are, you know, some slight issues. If the harassment was, uh, if the source of the harassment was from a coworker and not your boss, then you'd have to prove that the employer was on notice that was happening. Now, in your case, assuming that that's true that uh, you did go to the boss who just laughed. So, yeah, that just makes your case that much better. Um, Of course, in California, if your superior does that kind of thing, it's what we call strict liability. I mean, they're, you know, if you can prove harassment, then the company is liable. Okay. Wow. That's now, but back then. Yeah, that's, this was, yeah. Well, this is interesting to me because what Nancy talks about is, you know, going to the boss, you know, hello, this is what's going on. And then you've got the coworkers. And then your your next case that you brought up in your article is MF versus Pacific Pearl Hotel Management, LLC. And, um, <laughs> you know, 
that's the initials, Nancy. I didn't make that up. Um, anyway, so this is about this, you know, the a housekeeper that says that she got raped. Um, you know, this is the thing I know about yeah, traveling awful. and, and, you know, being in hotels and different places. And you sometimes, it's like, you know, living in an apartment or anywhere that you're staying around people, you have to be careful. You, if you really do. Like in a hotel, it, you know, the woman you go down to the bar you need to not let anybody follow you in the elevator to where you, and see where your room is. You know what I mean? You've got to be careful. Oh yeah, sure. And, and employees, I always worry about them because I see things happen. You know, as we travel, you, you see, you know, somebody would be drunk and like, Hey, you know, to the, the housekeeper. And, you know, if people are aware, it's the same thing as a bartender, a bartender is getting hit on by some dude and, you know, the bar manager sees that they need to take action, step like in, yeah. step yeah, in. Right. And because it's about the employees and the guests in the place, whether it's a hotel, a bar, a restaurant, anything, it could be a retail place. There's, it, you've been on a show talking about this before with security issues in a workplace. And if a, if the manager or the owner, the boss doesn't take a stance, so that can be detrimental, right? That you could have a lawsuit for not. If, if an employee tells you, hey, this person keeps harassing me every day and nobody does anything, can't the employee eventually sue them? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, once the employer is on notice. And again, if if the if a boss does it, then the employer, you don't have to put the employer on notice. The, the, the notice is already there because your boss is doing it. That's kind of the yeah. theory. So it's it's automatic. As long as you can prove harassment, it's automatic. The 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 company is it will be liable for harassment. Um, it's different with both coworkers and third parties. In this case, it was a third party. In in those two cases, you have to uh, put the employer on notice. So someone who's higher up in the company has to know that this is going on. And then you're right, should take proper remedial action. Um, and if they don't, then yeah. Now your case is pretty good. Okay, and so tell us about this case because um, this was she she claimed like a drunken trespasser raped her, right, and that the employer knew. And so, tell well, us about no, a little, no, a little different. The, the notice was uh, that there was another housekeeper who had been aggressively accosted by this trespasser. So it was someone who wasn't even supposed to be on the property. That's the third party. Okay. And the, the way the, the facts in the case worked out was this trespasser had approached another housekeeper and aggressively, it wasn't very explicit, but it said aggressively demanded sexual favors. Um, and so what was unsaid in the case was, well, was that told to anyone? Well, apparently, at least in the complaint that the plaintiff had filed, they alleged that, yes, the management knew that the first housekeeper had been accosted by this uh, trespasser. So that's the notice. Now, what do you do? Well, in this kind of situation, apparently you should take immediate action because if they're being aggressive, one housekeeper could happen. The other, you got to get this guy off the property. It really is common sense. If you think about it, I mean, if they're really being aggressive and it looks like they could, you know, do something that's not good, uh, even if the odds aren't fantastic that that will happen. I mean, you wouldn't expect a rape from this, but there it is. So you're on notice. You need to do something about it. And it, the simple thing is to go find them and lead them off the property. Yeah. Uh, that, that apparently didn't happen. Now, this case um, was for what we call a demurrer. So that means the, the plaintiff files a complaint, and then rather than answer, the defendant files a demurrer saying, hey, there's no case here, kick it out. Well, the court said, no, we're not going to kick it out now. We're going to let discovery go on and find out more of the specific facts to see if you really do have a case. So um, I, I don't know if this case is still going on. Uh, this yeah. is the only holding uh, at the appellate level that I know of. But uh, they certainly went through a discovery phase before any other motions were filed or went to trial. So the discovery phase is going and da gathering the facts because I, I, I wanted to get deep into this one because um, actually, you know, all of them, because I think when 
you know, if you're a housekeeper and you're working and, you know, the how many times are you reading up what to do in law? Like what, how is that procedure even going to happen? And then to stand up and to take time out. I mean, it's a disruptive thing in your life. And oh, we yeah. talk about this all the time. When is it worth going to, mm. to court about? When is it worth suing somebody? When is it worth, you know, all of that. And I think that's what's so hard on, on victims of something of a crime is you've already, you're, you're already going through crud. You're already feeling terrible or, or whatever's gone on. Um, whether it's theft, you know, discrimination, rape, I mean, all of these things that can happen in, in, a, in a place. Um, and then it's like, I'm, am I going to take action or am I going to just move on with my life? And do you really move on in your life depending on how bad the crime is? So it's, you know, or the attack is. And so it's very interesting to me about getting people to understand what are the first steps in something like this, because I think that's so important that people understand when they want to take action, how far it can go, how hard it could be. And if you want to do it, do it, but understand what it's going to take, you know, and, and how to get your evidence and things like that. Yeah. Well, the first thing you have to do is file a claim with either the EEOC or the Department of Fair Employment and Housing in California. Um, and you can get a right to sue letter after that, or you can let either agency investigate it. You can always get a right to sue later if you want. It just kind of depends how you want to handle it. And I talk to people about this all the time. And in some cases I go, well, maybe it's better uh, if you let the DFEH do an investigation. Um, you know, they're, the problem is they're pretty overworked. They have a lot of case files. So you're not, I, I can't guarantee that you're going to get enough time spent on your case. But there are times when I say, well, just see what happens there first, and then we can talk about it later, depending on what happens. Um, so, But that's the first step. And then if you do get a right to sue, and then you can sue in court. Um, and once you file a case in court, you know now the case is open. You're going to start discovery. You're going to do all sorts of things. Um, maybe it'll settle. And I, honestly, I favor that for most mm -hmm. plaintiffs because it can be such a painful thing to go through it, have your deposition taken, go through all that nasty stuff. But it really depends on the person and depends on the case. If they're not giving you anything, you go, hey, this, I think this case has got good value, then it doesn't make sense to settle. Um, and if the person is you know, tough, I mean, there's people who are tougher than others, and they just go, no, I want my day in court. Well, all right, have your day in court, and we'll see where it goes. Um, so it, it, it's partly a decision once you file your case, uh, of what the plaintiff really wants to undergo, uh, and you know, how much they want to relive this. Mm. So that's part of the decision process. That's hard. And so when I know that you take calls, like, you know, and I know you give a, a free consultation at first, you talk with people and, and that's the thing when you start to go, is this something that's viable or not, right? Is that, is that what happens oh, yeah. in the first oh, yeah. consultation? Is like, is this something you can really do something with or not? Because, you know, I think sometimes people also just get really pissy about where they're working and, you know, <laughs> they may have something and it's just now become this, you know, thorn in their side and, and maybe completely validated. And sometimes it's better to just go get a new job or, you well, know what I mean? Move careers, probably, you know, yeah. um, it's, which is difficult, but sometimes, that might be the answer, right? And is that what happens with the first consultation with you? It's like, well, maybe you, you don't want to, you know, do this <laughs> or, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think that issue always comes up in the first consultation, but it certainly uh -huh. does often. Um, more often what happens is uh, I'll say, all right, yeah, what happened to you is extremely unfair, but I'm not sure I can fit it in the box that will allow you to win a case. So well, it, it depends. Uh, now, a case like this, where someone's raped and the employer's on notice, you know, I'm, I'm going to say, well, <laughs> you know, that looks like, uh, you know, you can file a case and win this thing. Uh, then we're talking about, well, how much do we think it's worth? Uh, but in cases where, eh, yeah, he picked on you, but if he's yelling at everyone, men, women, you know, everyone, um, and it's not like explicitly sexual stuff or directed at women only, um, in other cases about that, but anyway, um, then it, there's, there are cases out there that say, well, if he's just a bad guy and a bad manager and he's mean to everyone, you don't have a case for harassment or discrimination. 
So, wow. you know, you, you got to go through all that. A, so if you're a wow. selective pig, then you get nailed. <laughs> but if you're a non-selective pig, then you get away with it. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, well, you know again, I, we're speaking in broad <laughs> terms. So it I really know, depends on the facts of the case. Pig. But there I'm may be afraid. other things. Yeah, there, there may be defamation. There may be uh, intentional yeah, infliction yeah. of emotional distress. I mean, there there could be a lot of other things. Um, yeah. But I'm just talking about the narrow issue of harassment yeah. and discrimination. And, and it, it, there really are, you know, several cases that say, well, he was just a jerk to everyone. So it, it doesn't look like he was a jerk to you because you're a woman. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this so, is crazy. Every case must be so complex. Every every single one is so different. About everybody You have to look at the specific facts. Yes, absolutely. Oh, the facts, ma'am. Yeah, Nothing I, but the I, facts. I, I think, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. You know, when you when you take a job and, and you've been there a few months and, and you get to know your manager or your boss or whatever, you do always have the option to quit and move on if you don't like your immediate Boss. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, um, it, so, you know, so when when it comes down to this dude's just a jerk, and he hasn't really done anything other than than be a jerk, that you can move on. You don't have to stay there. Yeah. I know it's a pain to go get another job, but some people but, are worth taking you know, down. I think that's a, <laughs> you know, well, this, exactly. I mean, you, yeah. you, First of all, you have to let an attorney take a look at your case and tell you what he thinks about he or she thinks about the case. Um, you know, listen to that, and you know maybe a different attorney has a different opinion. So you know you can listen to a different attorney as well, and and then assuming that someone's giving you a green light, then uh, you have to decide whether you want to do it or not. Hmm. Maybe it's and easier to move on. The the green light or not? Hmm. Because I mean, as an attorney you don't want to really spin your wheels either, right? I mean, it, isn't it come down to, you know, I know there's a lot of attorney jokes and I'm not going to do one word. I'm, I'm being really <laughs> nice. I'm not discriminating. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, but I'm serious about this. Um, I think when it's, you know, harassment or discrimination, somebody's feeling bad somewhere, you know? And the one thing you don't want to do is put yourself in the washing machine and the dryer and not win. And sometimes that does happen. Um, but I think it's really good to sit down with someone who knows those ropes and says, now you got something, it's, is it worth it to you is it or not? Um, and then also know when to bow out. I mean, and, and it sucks mm. to bow out when you're angry because there's an emotional thing too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes that, that's that part of like, I'm really pissed off, man. I want to take him down. Just, you know, and you have to look at it. How is it really going to happen? You know, what are what are the odds? And sometimes the odds, aren't in your favor and you do win it's it's odd how that it's, thing no that life. absolutely can win and so that's why attorneys usually talk about uh managing um the risk and it, it's on both sides you know i i uh consult with employers too about these mm -hmm. very issues right. and i'll say well look it looks like you did some good stuff here but there it looks to me that you know fact a and b gives you some risk so we have to decide you know, how hard do you want to fight it with this risk? Do you want to try to settle early? Do you want to do some discovery? Um, if we find X, do you want to keep going? You know, you know, what's your position? And I, that, especially with employers, I think that's my job is talking about the risk that they may face. Uh, but even with employees, well, I don't know if it's especially with employers. Employees, I go, well, <laughs> yeah, you, you've got risk of losing, you know. Uh, it, it, you may really have a hard time proving discrimination or harassment I think that you should be teaching in colleges about what can happen when you know people go off to work I'm just saying <laughs> because you know no we you know we talk about what happens to kids in school they don't know what happens to them when they go to college next thing you know you get in debt because they're sending you credit cards and all kinds of crazy stuff and you know, one thing I hear from students is they don't get taught about money. They don't get taught about the real world, what happens once you step in there. And I'm just saying, I don't think that when you start going out and getting jobs as a young person, I don't think you know what is harassment. You you know it feels bad, but you may not know what's going on. And I wish that you were out in schools and, and stuff teaching about what could happen, you know, what to be aware of. Mm -hmm. as as a, a person getting More a job preventative. prevention yeah, yeah and i know you do a lot of that um mm -hmm. and for you know adults and, and everything but i'm just saying ward 
is a whole new calling. <laughs> just yeah, like, well. That, it's just a thought out there because I don't think yeah. kids know about this. You could be working at a fast food thing as a kid. And I, I did that. And I had that guy, you know, pinch my butt and try to kiss me and, and require that I open with him. And then I had to, I left. Because if I didn't, I was about to hit the guy, and that wasn't going to be good. Um, because I will knock him out. <laughs> I was like, I said, I'm out. And then the, the <laughs> boss, the owner, was like, well, you should have told me. And I was like, Absolutely. I'm at this point, and if you're never there to talk to, what am I, you know, what am I supposed to do? And I was so young and, and mm. embarrassed that I just quit. And I don't think that there's that education of that that's happening um, for younger people. And then younger, look at all these young people starting businesses that don't know that side. They may have the creativity, but I just, I, I'm just saying on the younger generation, I, I think we need to have this conversation for them. Well, you know, that I think you're right. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, often people call me about being harassed and it, they certainly are being bugged, but that doesn't mean it fits into the definition of harassment as yeah, the right. law defines it in terms of protected class. So in order to have a case for harassment, they, the employer has to be picking on you because you're in a protected class, because you're a woman, because you're of a different color, because of your different nationality. So if you can, that's what you have to prove. Uh, proving just that they're bugging you and harassing you in the uh, colloquial term of it um, isn't enough. You have to show that they're picking on you because you're in a protected class. And so, yeah, I think a lot of education could be done about that. And, you know, shoot, maybe I'll uh, uh, apply or send in something to San Diego State and say, hey, you know, I could teach a class on this. Are you interested in having me? I, I like that idea. Why not? I, I, I and also for valid. the young entrepreneurs starting companies, yeah. And then, you know, people get all excited and they get happy. They made a big deal. They go get drunk and then they do something stupid with a partner or whatever. You know what I mean? You know how many stories of young people that are amazing, brilliant minds and they have one drunk night and everything can go down the toilet mm -hmm. because, because they don't know sure. these other things. Yeah. So I think it's two-sided. And you see so many young entrepreneurs right now that are amazing. I mean, and then later that one part of that foundation wasn't put in there. You know what I mean? If they didn't go and do the college side or sometimes they did, there's that one thing. And I just, I, dude, I'm just saying, <laughs> we're still waiting for your book, by the way, Ward. Well, <laughs> you know, this is like the Ward educator mode today. I don't, I don't think if, if we're going to talk about junior high school and high school, that that's to prepare you to go to college mm -hmm. or prepare you to go to work. I think it prepares you to go to college. I don't think, as I recall back, I don't know what it's like now, obviously, I don't think it prepares you for life in any way, no. shape at all. No. no way. It doesn't prepare you. It it talks to you, you go to career day, how to get a job, but they don't tell you how to be when you get a job. Right. I, I don't, I don't. Well, you know that. what? That's very interesting that you brought that up because uh, my girls, I have three daughters and they all go to high tech, uh, high tech high and high tech middle media arts. Mm -hmm. um, my youngest is in eighth grade, so she's in middle school still, but she'll go to high school next year. And they teach um, in a project based environment. And what I've heard okay. about that is, is, you know, they, they really don't, learn from textbooks very much or as much as most mm -hmm. schools do and that's really what you're talking about yeah. they, they learn more from uh, handouts and then applying those handouts to a practical problem in class and oh, yeah. often the problem is interdisciplinary so what I have heard is yeah sometimes the kids actually have uh, you know some difficulties especially in their freshman year with you know mm -hmm. transitioning to learning from a textbook um, it depends on the kid. I mean, it's not universal, but um, but certainly when they get out in the workforce, I've I've heard uh, stories about they're really pretty well prepared to be part of a workforce because of that right. type of education. So I think there's some flexibility in that now. It's not just mm -hmm. like it was when we were kids. Yeah. Um, it's not all on on the job training. I, uh, some schools really are geared to teaching people how to function in a group setting and accomplish tasks together. 
my skin and I think that. that's awesome. Yeah, I just, you know. I, li- I listened to this whole segment about kids calling in and talking about going back to school and what they wanted, mm-hmm. depending on where they lived, how they didn't have the training that they needed and the, and the communities weren't set up to even have vocational training. And some kids wanted to go and, you know, open a, a car shop or they wanted to be a mechanic or they wanted to be in agriculture, but there was nothing in their town or community to set them up for that. It's always like, you're going to go to this college and this is what you're going to do. And they're like, that's not what I want to do. Yeah. I want to do this and there's nothing to help me here. So I'm going to leave my town. And, and, and at that same point, they're not getting that education. So I think it's different of where you are. I know you're in California and California has so many cool programs. I mean, it's, um, and I know it's always still building. Every place is always building. Um, but I think it, it would be cool to have you go out there and teach people. And I want to go back to the last case we were talking about. And you were talking about um, proof. Like, okay, so this lady is now going to stand up and say, okay, um, I got in trouble in regard to, I got, you know, raped and I told somebody, hey, you need to watch out for this guy. And now you're going to go to the discovery phase. How does she prove this all? And so when something's going down, how do you prove it all? And your next case that you're going to talk about, um, she tried and, and got in trouble for it. I mean, it didn't work on her, on, on, mm-hmm. and her positive. And she did something I would do because I walk around with a recorder and record things. <laughs> and then I fall down manholes, as we know. Uh, but Cornell versus <laughs> Berkeley Tennis Club, um, this, this lady, you know, this is it, it's interesting because she tried to record what was going on. Um, and she wised up, and you've got to give everybody the background on this, but she wised up to, I'm going to get some proof here, and it hurt her in the end. So it's really hard, I think, when you're in a harassment situation or discrimination situation to get the evidence sometimes. So give everyone the backup on this on this case. Bad. Yeah, I, yeah, I will. It's well. It, it, so far, it's ended well for her. She. This was a summary judgment motion, which means they've gathered uh, facts through discovery. They present those facts in a motion, so there's no testimony. There's declarations that people sign under penalty of perjury, things like that. And um, the court said, well, at least on these three, there. I think there were like eight different uh, causes of action, and three survived. So. You know, that's not too bad. She had three that it's going to go forward to trial or they'll settle. And again, I don't know what happened in this case. And it, it may not have gone to trial, may not have been appealed afterward. I mean, who knows? Um, so anyway, that's the setting of it. And oh, one more thing. Uh, I had to get this case because my daughter's a freshman in Berkeley. And that's why I was up in uh, San Francisco last uh, oh, cool. month, or last weekend. Yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah, I got to talk about Berkeley now. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Berkeley Tennis Club. Here we are. Um, yeah. and, but wow. the other reason why I chose this is it's about the broadening standards for disability based on obesity. Uh, and it really has come a long way. The uh, the ADA was interpreted uh, by the Department of Labor uh, to be very restrictive of uh, obesity claims based on disability. Uh, and in fact, at one point, it, it's a regulation that said it rarely will obesity ever be a disability. But that has changed dramatically, and this case is an example of that. So she uh, was obese from childhood. She weighed 350 pounds. She was five feet, five inches. Uh, She wore size 5X and 7X. And I went into a lot of these facts because I just think we needed, I needed to set out the facts so people got a feel for what Mm -hmm. these cases are like now. And there was an, she got great reviews or good reviews anyway, uh, until the management changed and the new manager, uh, wanted to do things differently. Now, was he picking on her? It's not completely clear. Did he say, seem to say things? She alleged that at least he had say things that look like he might be picking on her. Certainly. Um, he wanted everyone to wear uniforms and she had said, Hey, um, since I'm a five X or seven X, that might be pretty tough to find me a uniform that will fit. And he, uh, she says that he mockingly laughed at her and said, oh, yeah. And um, then she explained, hey, I'm 5X, 7X. It's just not going to, I don't think you can find one. And he didn't. In fact, he said, okay, everyone go get your uniform. And the largest one was a 2X. And she felt terrible about not being able to find one. Um, 
the case also says I didn't include this that she went out and got her own uniform and put the um, club label on it, the club emblem oh. on it. Um, oh. So she made her own. She went out and, and did that herself. Oh my god! Yeah. And and she's yeah. been there for what? What? She was employed there for sixteen years, around sixteen yeah. years before this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I, she started as a part-time employee in 1997, became full-time employee uh, in 2001 after she graduated from Berkeley, and then um, again, you know, worked as the night manager um, for years and years and years, and also did day shifts. And after this new manager took over in 2012, he took away her day shifts and actually paid the new person on the day shifts. Now, you know, she would just fill in for the day shift, so it wasn't like she was scheduled for it, but she'd fill in a lot. Um, so he hired someone else who was much smaller, and he paid that person a dollar more. So she felt really bad about that. And, you know, you can imagine what's going on in her mind when all this yeah. stuff is going on. Um, and then she, uh, another employer saw, uh, saw her crying and she explained, hey, I, you know, I lost my day shift hours and I'm getting paid less than the new day shift employee. And uh, this employee, the other employee uh, approaches the manager and he says, well, well, just look at her. She's going to be jealous of anybody. <laughs> you know? so, um, so that, yeah, that's pretty powerful. And that's from another employee. So that, and, and when you talk about proof, very often you want to go to, other employees to back your story. That makes your story much better, much stronger. Uh, very often, the best place to go for that kind of thing is employees who've been terminated or who have left because they have nothing to lose. It's right. fairly common for employees who are presently working at uh, for the employer that uh, they don't want to jeopardize their own job and testify exactly. against their employer. So, you know, it's, there's, there, you know, there's all sorts of issues with these cases. There are all sorts of issues with getting the, the uh, supporting facts. Doesn't mean you can't win with just the uh, employee who has filed the case's testimony, but it, it, very often it makes it just so much stronger if you can get someone else to help her. But I'm so, you Come on, a company can go and get a special size uniform made. There's no way that that cannot. Uh, well, you know, and if you're sitting on the jury, I'm going to guess you are, you're going to side with her. Absolutely. And I and I totally get it. And I, you know, I I'm not sure if they got into those facts. If uh, if the I don't even know if this case went to trial. Uh, if it did go to trial, I would assume some of those facts would come out. But ne- even if not, someone on the jury is going to be thinking exactly what you thought. <laughs> so yeah. uh, you don't necessarily have to say own, it. <laughs> The yeah. fact that she made her own uniform right there is like she tried. She tried. And, she tried. and then this is what, you know, I mean, it's like, and, and management change right there tells me something, right? This is this is crazy, and then you, you're going into other employees too. But that could work for you if everybody says, "Oh, this guy is an idiot to everybody." That could fall, make it worse, right? Like we were talking about in the beginning, or like there there are potentially. There, and sometimes when employees leave, don't they sometimes like you? You're going to not say anything about this company. You're not going to you're going to be an omarosa and not say anything, and then you're going to leak oh, tapes right. in a book. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like you're not gonna. Say, I'm just saying. You know, yeah, you're, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna, like, you know, not say anything, and then you know, things will come out later, somewhere down the road. All I can say is, when someone has seen something, you know, no matter how many things they've been, they've signed or been paid off, eventually, stuff comes out in the wash. Isn't that true, Ward? Come on, you know it is, right? <laughs> it comes out in the wash somewhere. Well, yeah, no, I think, yeah, karma does come back. It has a way of doing that. And so if that's what you're referring to, I agree. Um, in uh, whether it's like you, in your specific oh, case or not, you know, it's, uh, I can't yeah. say that you always win your case when you should. Uh, the proof standards yeah. are kind of high sometimes. And usually the hardest part is getting it past a judge on the summary judgment like this case. Once you get it in front of a jury, especially up in San Francisco, where juries are way more liberal in San Diego, mm-hmm. um, th- this case could be worth a lot of money. <laughs> so, wow. and Berkeley, Berkeley, like just, I'm going to send you that book, uh, Face Gender, because uh, she, she 
was like rocking Berkeley. She she did Berkeley was her playground, and she started the. She was like one of the first judges, female judges. Mm-hmm. And anyway, I I just I'm still like this woman rocks. <laughs> but anyway, just as fascinating to me, um, when you start going into certain areas, how things changed. Um, she was a woman. Um, oh my God, the Soledad brothers. She got them a trial, and they were basically locked away, and they weren't going to get out. And and she got them a trial. Oh. Okay. And that isn't that like sometimes to get someone into trial is a big deal. Sometimes you have to really, really work it to get them into a trial because things may have not gone well leading up to that. But to get somebody a trial, especially on a criminal case, got to be difficult. You know? You mean another trial? Like a crim? Like the, the don't the big, you always get a trial? Like a big trial? Yeah. When you're going to go up to the Supreme Court and stuff like yeah. that, you're going to get up there instead of taking a deal um, or not getting a deal. Some of these people didn't get deals at all. And now I don't know what I'm talking about, but all I know is what she did rocks. <laughs> I'm just going to like words on the show. I can't say anything. I'm done now. <laughs> but I want to, I want to go. And, and number one, I do love that this is Cornell versus Berkeley. I think that's funny. Sorry. That's just because really co- two colleges. Yeah. It, oh, it's a great name too. Yeah. In case I know. I know. Um, take, go Cornell for all the birds. Because <laughs> they're the they bird the place. best ornithology department ever. Ever. But um, anyway. And that's what we know about them. <laughs> and, and Berkeley, they rise up, man, um, on anything. But let's, let's go back to, you know, what was going on with her because here's all this stuff going on. But then she tried to record the board, right? When right. they were going to talk about her. Well, now, I you know, the that. facts aren't 100%. <laughs> well, the facts aren't 100% clear on that. Uh, oh, okay. And I did a, pr- a brief synopsis of it. The, what it, the case really talked about was the, an employee was cleaning up, what well, you know, was getting ready for the board meeting, and the board was going to discuss Corn- the Cornell issues and some other issues. So she wasn't the only one on the docket. Um, and, and when the employee was preparing, they found this tape recorder that was on in a place where. Um, what was said by the board would be captured by the tape recorder. So he reported it, I think it was a him, reported it to the manager and the manager said, okay, I'm going to hold this and we're going to see where, who tries to get it afterwards. So then later, after everything's over, the meeting's over, um, they, that employee or the, uh, one, the employee or the manager, one of them, saw her in that area reaching in that undisclosed location for something. And they, they, they assume that she's reaching for the tape recorder. And she she says, no, I was just looking for cleaning supplies that are normally there. I I was not trying to record anything. So, you know, uh, you decide, you decide. (laughs) Um, So, you know, it, it sounds pretty bad in terms of, what she did so then they uh so then they terminated her for surreptitiously trying to record the board meeting you know we can't trust you i mean that's a good reason to terminate someone uh we can't trust you it's against the law it's a felony in california to do that so there's every reason to get rid of someone for that but the you know the uh, the problem with that is she's already uh, undergone all these humiliating situations and does that mean that she can't bring a harassment claim? I would say, no, you can't bar the harassment claim because of that. And uh, even a discrimination claim, I mean, be, there is a doctrine that allows you to cut off discrimination claims if you found facts that, would have, that, that you later found, you know, during discovery, that, that would have led to her termination maybe a year before. But this was the night she was terminated. So... All this stuff could still, I, I think, you know, the court didn't kick any of this stuff out. So I'm thinking that uh, none of this, all this stuff can get in front of the jury. Maybe a judge will kick some of that, I don't know, on a motion at trial. Um, but it seems like the timing favors her, even if she did plant the recording. Now, would the recording have helped her? I don't know what was on it. Uh, there, I did try a case in March where we had rec- – similar recordings done and I was trying to get them in the evidence and the, and I filed motions uh, before the trial started and said, Hey, we need this in. And here's all the exceptions to the rule because normally it is excluded, but there are exceptions. 
And I said, you know, the exceptions should apply. And the judge didn't even let me argue. He said, no, it's not coming in. I said, come on, judge. Wow. He, just, he just shut me down. So, oh. uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's not easy to get that stuff into evidence. No, but wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be, um, even if she shouldn't have done it, if she did it, right? Because we really still don't know that that's for sure. If Even if she had done it, that... Um, First of all, they probably erased everything if they found it before she could get her hands on it. Well, they might have. Yeah, we yeah, all know about that. So, yeah, they probably erased it, but I well, no, no. I, you know what? They, I'm sorry. Um, they, they didn't record anything because he removed it, so uh, nothing was recorded. Oh, there is no evidence. Uh, did, but did they fingerprint it to see that it was actually? But she touched it because they, she said she was looking for cleaning supplies or whatever. Well, no, she didn't touch it. It was already removed. The, oh. the employee oh. was the employee who found it was setting up for the meeting and found it and gave it to the boss, and then the boss yeah. held it. So wow. nothing was recorded. Uh, I, and, Prince would have done it. Nancy's going off into detective mode. Well, wouldn't no. you fingerprint it? Well, you, I don't think you care at that point. Oh. I mean, you, you know, do you want, like do you want to pay a thousand bucks to have it uh, fingerprinted and, and oh, so what if her fingerprints are on it, it you're fired her anyway. Um, you know, she's terminated. So the question is, well, was she terminated because she was talking about harassment? Um, was she terminated because uh, she because you're picking on her because she's heavy uh, or you did you terminate her because she uh, hid this tape recorder? So and, I think in terms of wrongful term, you see there were three cases, there were three yeah. uh, causes of action that survived. They were the harassment, the discrimination, and uh, the wrongful discharge. Uh, the wrongful discharge could really go away there because they could say, "Hey, look, you know, they didn't discharge you because you're heavy. They just they discharge you because you planned this recording." Yeah. Um, the discrimination might go away because of that. I mean, what is the adverse employment action? You know, termination is one of them. So if the termination was based on uh, a good reason and, and jury believes that, well, maybe that goes away too. The harassment's a, a, a harder one to, to uh, get rid of based on the recording or wow. her, you know, assuming that she attempted to record it. The harassment and, so and, and if she did, I mean, she was just trying to like back herself up, well, and yet think, that yeah, would have they, still gone against her. I think you know, well, to it. it's tough to get that evidence in. I mean, it you certainly can. There are cases that talk about it, but you do have to find the yeah. exception, and it has to fit in pretty neatly to that exception. And even then, I think most trial judges, I got to tell you, I I've only had that uh, issue come up in one case uh, where we went to trial. I mean, I've had in other cases, but they just didn't go to trial. Um, and my feeling, because I like this judge, and I, my feeling is that most judges are going to look at it and go, their initial reaction is going to be, oh, no, this isn't coming in. You're really going to have to convince them, I think. Oh, wow. So what's it like hmm. for you as an attorney voting? <laughs> if you vote for judges? Voting. Because I just want to bring this up, because wow. when we look at it, you know, how many people, they think about presidential, you know, we all look at voting, and, and then we get into local. And a lot of times we're looking at governors, Senate, senators, and maybe just local, you know, mayors and things like that. But when it comes into judges, uh, judges I think that's where a lot of us uh, screw up as individuals and communities, not realizing the power of a judge. Uh, do you do you think that we need to do more education on that at all, in regards to understanding who we're electing as judges? And you got to be nice, I know, to your judges because well, you know, don't speak well, out first of all. <laughs> First of all, most judges aren't challenged. Uh, normally, a judge gets in by appointment from the governor. That would be their first mm -hmm. term on the bench. Eventually, if you're on the in the Superior Court bench, um, you're, you'll have to come up for re-election or for election for your first election. And uh, most of the judges who are sitting are not challenged. No one wants mm -hmm. to challenge them because they know it's tough. Most people don't care that much about judges. One. Right. Uh, but you talked about education, and I actually I think at least in California we do a pretty good job. They do uh, give some information about if if the person's challenged about their positions and things like that. Um, I'm just trying to think for judges though, how much information do they give? You know, I I'm not sure. I know that for for people who are running for office, they certainly give positions. 
uh, in a pamphlet that everyone can read. And I read that thing. And uh, judges, I, you know, honestly, I don't remember, but they're there. And I, there is some information, uh, some background information, but I don't think physicians, because you know, judging is a little, it's not supposed to be, you know, quote unquote political. You see it on the Supreme Court nominations, they go, hey, you know, I can't tell you how I'm going to decide a future case. Yeah. Don't ask me about yeah. that. And so yeah, it's don't a ask dicey. me about something yeah, that's, you know, not Seriously. like directly exactly what has happened. Well, I, think, <laughs> I think that whole thing's about to change because it's on the news every night. So I think that people are learning about our government through the last couple of years. I think so too. Well, maybe. We'll see. I mean, the it's judiciary is supposed to be removed uh, from political uh, influence. Well, you know, yeah, nothing's not political now. Everything. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, not, as, much as, possible, cream, you know, as much as possible. As much as possible. If you, you eat Chick Fil A, it's cream, political. Do you want a red ice cream or a blue? Yeah, ice cream? I know. It's like <laughs> your tennis shoes are political. Ice cream. I mean, yeah, you know, the chicken. Everything. It's all political <laughs> now, and it's like, okay, I'm just gonna drink wine, <laughs> or I'll drink oh, a crazy, oh, red crazy or raven cocktail that you made. <laughs> <laughs> your, your red wine, your white wine, and your crazy yeah, raisin. well, and you can make that in in multiple colors. You know, depends if you dye the craisins or not. See, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, uh, Ward, really, always I, I good like it. I, I, <laughs> My cocktail and, that I that one fifth place. <laughs> I know. Hey, you made it. No, but seriously, you know, we went through so many oh, cocktails, and um, we went to the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill, and they made. Uh, we got Sean. To sit and make every single cocktail, we filmed it, and you can see Ward's cocktail. Uh, if you go to Craven Raven Cocktail on BlendRadioTV.com, you'll get his recipe for his cocktail, and he got into the top five. And uh, they decided to to dye his craisins, <laughs> put them into a martini glass, and it was good. Um, we enjoyed both uh, dyed and undyed. By the way, we we did both, and um, it, they I thought it was very refreshing personally. I yes, was like, just leave me alone good. with this, and. Um, but apparently, I wasn't allowed to drink the entire cocktail for every single one. Apparently, they said you have to film and you can't do that. You were um, cut off. But later, I did, <laughs> and um, I'm really glad that they have a hotel connected to the bar. That's all I have to say about that. It's very it's convenient to and we stumble back to your room. <laughs> we were supposed to go hiking at five in the morning, and does that anyone think happen. that happened? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was cool. It was I very cool. I think we're going to take all the other recipes and, and just test them one by one. I know, but you're crazy. <laughs> I thought it was so clever. No one, not one recipe, not one recipe came mm. in with crazen. Yeah. Like, duh. <laughs> and that was well, like, I, I like the the rhyme. That's why I did it. Yeah. I know. Yeah, crazen, I know. Raven, and I, was crazy. Yeah, I was like, duh. Not one person came in with that. We did have one person say, to, they they changed the name to the Roto Rooter, that was and bad. it was prune juice it and um, prune juice and root beer schnapps. No, that's just disgusting. So he didn't make it into the top five. No, but there was a lot of we had a lot of people. That's at, disgusting. But somehow <laughs> Southern California represented in the cocktail contest. They yeah. did, and it was like check that out. Southern California knows cocktails, mm. and they're going against Florida. And Florida, I know personally, knows cocktails. Yeah. And you know that. Yeah, but they're more foo-foo cocktails. Well, I mean, yeah, the fruity, yeah. fruity things. Or do you, you go to Florida. They're good at cocktails, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, Miami, yeah, Miami's great at cocktails. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But good job. You won fifth place. You got a T-shirt and an album from the Cravens yep. fans. And it's a good yep. album. Super so, cool. Thanks for, for playing. <laughs> Ding! <laughs> uh, everybody... <laughs> Go get uh go go to bestemploymentattorneysandiego.com if you're in San Southern California or all of California and I'm gonna say now that uh, your daughter's in San Francisco that uh, you may be going to San Francisco a little bit more. <laughs> so oh yeah, San Francisco absolutely. All, all ward. Um, but you 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 work with everyone in California, right? And from the top to the bottom, everywhere. So um, everybody again, bestemploymentattorneysandiego.com and his article, Ward's article on harassment and discrimination in the uh, hotel tourism and uh, let's say country clubs <laughs> or tennis clubs and film industry is up on nationalparktraveling.com. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Ward. We've got a special song, you know. Yeah, well, I can't wait to hear it. Well, in my yeah. pleasure. Thanks for having me.
Thank you. This song, and it's very funny because you didn't know the name of the song, and you said this a few times in the show. This song is called Know Your Value. <laughs> and it's, well, that's, you talked about it. It's the value. Are you going to go, how far are you going to take this? You know, Know Your Value. It's from the Brutalists, uh, a very new rock and roll group, uh, not new in talent. Uh, featuring founding LA Guns member Mick Cripps and London, London Choir Boys founder Nigel Mogg. Uh, this is their brand new album. It's called, you know, The Brutalist, and you can get it on Cleopatra Records. Uh, go to cleorex.com or go to brutal, thebrutalist.net. So they're based in LA, and uh, if you get a chance, Ward, go check them out because this is really one of the best albums of the year. I'm serious, The Brutalist. Go check it out. Here it All is. Right. Know your value. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Ward. Thanks. Ward. You're welcome. Slipper is well loose. 